2nd Samuel chapter 14 2nd Samuel 14 and there are three major individuals that are interacting in this chapter and that's Joab and Absalom and King David and before we get into this particular storyline I want to remind us who these guys are King David easy enough he's the reigning king of Israel but he's also the one who took Bathsheba away from her husband and killed her husband so that he could have her we'll talk a little bit more uh, at the end of the lesson about some of the uh, his identi- how we would identify him Joab is David's general he's the chief over his armies he has been winning lots of battles on David's behalf uh, and kind of watching out for David's best interest. Remember, they were about to finish up a battle, and Joab sent word to David and said, I've got them surrounded, I'm about to finish them off, and so unless people give me the credit for winning this campaign, you need to leave Jerusalem and come down here with me so you can have the credit for having uh, demolished this city. And so David did. Uh, and then Absalom. Absalom Uh, is the brother of Tamar, who was raped by her half-brother Amnon. So Absalom kills Amnon and then runs away to Geshur so that he has a place to hide. He's a political exile at the time that this particular passage begins. So all three of those guys have interacted for years and years and years. Of course, Absalom's known David all of his life. Uh, David has had at least some interaction with Absalom. He's not the firstborn as Amnon was, but he's still one of David's sons, and they would have had interaction. And, of course, David and Joab have worked together for years and years on many campaigns and in many situations. So the three of them are not strangers at all. Now, Absalom, again, is in Geshur. He is um, uh, in exile He and David have not spoken for quite a while, and Joab decides that he's going to intervene. He wants to change that situation. Now, remember that Amnon is not, I'm sorry, not Amnon, uh, uh, Abner, uh, I'll get it here in a minute. Joab is not always in it just for David. He works for David, He does things that are good for David, but he doesn't always follow instructions when he's working for David. And I'll give you the one big example. Do you remember Joab's brother, Asahel? He was a kid. He went into battle and he was chasing one of the leaders of the opposing army. He was chasing one of the leaders of Saul's army. And he kept telling him, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And then finally he thrusts backwards and kills him. So that is Abner, the commander of Saul's armies. David makes a a deal with him after the defeat of Saul's armies. And Abner is going to be part of David's uh, army. He's going to just come over and, and become part of the new kingdom, and Joab murders him. David has called a truce with him, and they have set everything up, and then Joab goes and kills him. So Joab has his own agenda along with working for David. Uh, So he doesn't always follow the king's commands. All right, um, we're going to start reading in chapter 14, verse 1, and just read the first three verses. Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart was longing for Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, pretend you are in mourning. Dress in mourning clothes. and Don't use any cosmetics uh, or lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. So we've got a type of play 
that Joab is orchestrating for this woman to go and to talk to David. And what we're going to find out, that this is very similar to what Nathan did to David when Nathan came and told him the story about the sheep. There was this one man that had all these sheep, but he doesn't kill any of his. He takes that one little lamb from next door, and David says, well, I'll you know, bring him here to me. I'll take care of it myself. That's the kind of story she's going to tell him, something that just tugs at his heartstrings, and then she's going to turn the tables on him. Like Nathan said, oh, you are the man. This woman is going to kind of take the same tact and say, well, David, you have the same problem that I'm describing to you. So here's the story. She says that I am a widow and I have two sons. One of my sons killed the other son. Does that sound familiar? Absalom killed Amnon. Right? So he's now in exile. But one of my sons killed the other son. And now the people of the area where I live are demanding justice. In those days, you had a member of your family that was kind of designated that if someone was killed, that they were the officer of retribution. They would go and kill that person to bring things back to level. She didn't have another son. She just had the two. So she has one son who's the fugitive, and the people of the town are going to offer retribution. They're going to kill the son who did the murdering. Uh, now, if they kill him, what does that leave her? She's, her husband is dead. Her two sons, which would have inherited the land and inherited her to take care of, would both be dead. So she would have been a widow with no way of taking care of herself. So that's the story that she tells David. And David is willing to defend her case. He thinks that's a legitimate cause. He wants to stand up on her behalf uh, and personally make sure that they don't harm her surviving son. Uh, so then she turns the tables on him and look over at uh, verse... Let's just start in verse 13. The woman said, Why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son. Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we all must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. So the woman accuses David of a couple of things. First of all, she calls him a hypocrite, the same thing that Nathan did. Uh, you say that you know, stealing somebody else's sheep is a bad thing, and yet you stole a man's wife. Uh, and she says, well, you say that it's wrong for them to hurt this son and to, to take him away from me, but what about your son? You don't care about him. You've left him abandoned. You've left him in exile all this time. Now David is a soft-hearted guy. He wants to do what's right. And so he listens to this woman. Uh, as she talks to David, he begins to see a pattern in the things that she's saying. He's a little slow, but he catches up. Let's keep going. Verse uh, 15. She says, now I have come to say this to my lord the king because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king. Perhaps he will grant his servant's request. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from God's inheritance. And now your servant says, may the word of my lord the king secure my inheritance for my lord the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the Lord your God be with you. Then the king said to the woman, Don't keep from me the answer to what I'm going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. And the king asked, Isn't the hand of Joab with you in all of this? He's starting to, to smell a rat. He's like, I, I think Joab must have put you up to this. And she admits it. She says, Absolutely, that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, and, but she says it in such a sweet way. 
As surely as you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything my lord the king says. Yes, it was your servant Joab who instructed me to do this and who put all these words into my mouth or into the mouth of your servant. Your servant Joab did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. Uh, we had a good friend. In fact, uh, Becky worked for his wife for quite a while, worked for him for a little while, named Lynn Martin. And he had the gift that this woman has of always saying the most flattering things to people. And it was to the point that you knew that it was flattery. Uh, when he would say something to you, you might blush a little, but you kind of knew, well, you know, that's just Lynn. He's always going to say the nicest thing he could think of to say. So, which is, sure beats the alternative of some people that are just ugly all the time. Lynn would always say something really flattering to you. And this woman just keeps flattering David. Now, she's come from Tekoa, and she has come in here and lied to David and set David up to talk about something that is absolutely none of her business. Does David get mad at her? No. She's flattered him. She's told him a story that he was ready to get behind. And now she's turned it around and said, it's really because we care about you and your son Absalom. That's the whole reason I'm here. Joab hired me to come and tell you all of these things. But she does it in such a sweet way, it's a little hard for David to be too angry with this woman. So the king said to Joab, uh, very well, I'm going to do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. So Joab is put in uh, charge of getting Absalom back into Israeli territory. Joab goes and gets him from Geshur, sets him up back at his own home, and then Joab goes home, and nobody talks to Absalom. Absalom is not invited to the palace to go see Daddy when he gets back. Uh, Joab, who was instrumental in putting all this stuff together, he goes back home, he goes back to work, and Absalom is just, he's kind of exiled inside of Israel. He never really quits being exiled, he just changes locations. So he's back at his own home. And I want to notice a couple of things in verse 28. It says, Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. You know how big Jerusalem is? It's about the size of downtown Shamrock. It's not huge. right? You could walk around Jerusalem in a day. But David is in his palace and then there's the uh, a few other houses there. There's the uh, uh, tabernacle is up there on the top of the hill. But Absalom doesn't even run into him. So it seems orchestrated, right? David makes sure that he's not seeing Absalom. So for two years, he stays and never sees the king's face. Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king. He's going to try to at least get an audience, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, look, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set his field on fire. So the guy who orchestrated getting him out of exile now has his fields on fire because Absalom feels slighted because David won't talk to him, Joab won't talk to him. So again, he's kind of a stranger in his own country. He's just stuck in that place. So Joab finally did go to Absalom's house and he said, why have your servants uh, set my fields on fire? And Absalom said, look, I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king to ask why have I come from Geshur? It would have been better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I'm guilty of anything, then let him put me to death. So he's in a position where it's, it's all or nothing. I should have just stayed where I was. If I'm going to be here, it'd be better for me 
if I were just dead, and if I if he doesn't have any charges to bring against me, if he's not going to prosecute me for Amnon's death, then he needs to see me. So Joab did go to the king and told him this. The king summoned Absalom, and he came and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So we went through all of this to get David and Absalom face to face again. Now, is, is Absalom being back in Jerusalem a good thing? No. No, it's going to turn out to be a terrible thing. Uh, it's going to end up with Joab killing Absalom even when David has told him not to. So it would be the second time that Joab uh, refuses to follow orders from David and ends up killing somebody that David has said don't do it. But that's a couple of chapters ahead of us. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the dysfunction in this family. I can't help it. Uh, it's the, the area in which I was trained. But think about some of the things that have happened in the last few years. David has lost two firstborn sons. He lost the firstborn son that he had with Bathsheba, and he lost Amnon. He lost another of his sons who has been exiled because he killed one of the other sons. So his family has been in turmoil, and as a father who is trying to raise sons who are going to take over when you're gone, having them die and get exiled one by one is a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, then you've got Joab's relationship with David, which sometimes is really wonderful, but sometimes is very tenuous. So who do you trust? David has this woman show up at his door and tell him this long story. And even though he agrees with her and even though he eventually brings Absalom back, what does that do with your relationship with your general? Joab is sliding things in the side and trying to run the government from outside. And that's got to be difficult for David. Um, as far as Absalom is concerned, he has had to go through the rape of his sister. He has the blood of his half-brother on his hands. He was exiled for a period of time where he couldn't even be in his home. He comes back to his home, and while he's there, he can't see somebody who lives a stone's throw away. His own father won't see him because he's exiled within his own town. Look back up at chapter 14 verse 27. And you'll see just a, just a hint of uh, some of the things he was going through. Three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. His daughter's name was Tamar. And she became a beautiful woman. We know that Tamar went to his house after she was raped by Amnon. Don't know whether she was still living with him whether she had gotten married in the meantime. We don't know what happened to Tamar the aunt, but Tamar the niece is now living in Absalom's house. So every time her name is called, it's not, all, it's not a happy thing to hear the name Tamar because Tamar, as much as he might have loved his sister, has interrupted his life tremendously because he had to stand up and defend her against his half-brother. Um, and another thing that was probably going on, Absalom was a very strong-willed man, and we find that out even more later on. And he couldn't fix it. He couldn't fix what had happened to Tamar. He killed Amnon, but that didn't fix what happened to Tamar. He named his daughter after his sister, but that didn't fix what happened to Tamar. So there's always going to be a part of Absalom that is empty, that's, that can't be filled up because he can't fix what happened. And he has to live with all the decisions that he's made because that it happened. So all of these guys are rotating around each other. 
They're all in the same neighborhood. They all share very fam familiar backgrounds. They have a lot of experiences in common. And eventually, all three of them are going to end up in a very cataclysmic uh, confrontation when Absalom gets old enough and popular enough for long enough. Let me just get us into 15 and we'll cover it next week. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run in front of him. Why did he have 50 men running in front of him? Here comes Absalom. They were announcing him. He felt so important. He kept trying to fix things he couldn't fix. He wanted the kingdom. And eventually he would do whatever it took to try to get it. So Lord willing, we'll get into that sometime in the near future. Any questions about any of that? Any thoughts? Oh, okay. See you guys later.